You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for TWIFO This Week in Futures Options, the program that puts all of the action in the options going up on CME this week in your hot little hands, or in this case, in your ear holes. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the TAG optionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which all of you are mainlining these days. Remember, if you like what you hear, this show, anything else on the network, throw a like, a star, a comment. All that stuff does help new folks continue to discover the world of futures options. And hey, the more the merrier. The more folks listening, the more folks trading futures options, the more liquid and deeper the products become that you love. It's a win-win for everyone out there at the end of the day. If you want to win even more, head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro to join us on the pro side for options oddities for great pro Q&A. Scott Bauer has been a guest on this program many times, doing a deep dive into all things futures, options, and volatility, and everything else, crypto, answering all of your questions over there on our pro Q&A this week. So check that out, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. It's also February 1st. Time to give away our pro trading crate. So look forward to that coming up soon for all of you who were active in the pro last month. If you weren't, get in there now. Become active for February. It automatically enters you to win the pro trading crate, which... No small amount of effort and expense on our part to put those together and send those out to you folks, but we love it. It's a labor of love at the end of the day, and you folks do like it. They are pretty cool bespoke crates for each of you out there. So check it out, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. As we check out who's joining us on the TWIFO program this week, I am pleased to welcome back on for the second time already this year. He's just fighting his way onto the hot seat every week. Our old pal, Mr. Dan Gramza from Gramza Capital Management. Mr. Dan Welcome back to the show, sir. How are things going in the land of Gramza Capital Management? All goes well, comma. Thanks, Mark. The markets have been interesting, as always. You know, I've, I'm never bored. 
there's always something. There's always an opportunity out there. And that's what's always fascinated me and continues to do so. So I'm looking forward to exploring these markets with you today. All right, then let's get to it. A little bit of the old movers and shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show we break down everything, lighting it up to the light side and to the dark side over there at CME this week. Going to change things up a little bit this week. Got a couple of extra reports to talk about for you. And, of course, at the top of the show, Dan, we can't bury the lead. Of course, it was a Fed week, so that also brings into light another tool. We talk about every now and then over there at CME, but folks should be watching this all the time. This is, of course, uh, the Fed Watch. You can find this just cmegroup.com slash Fed Watch, of course, is the place to go. Uh, fascinating stuff out there watching the ebb and flow and the probabilities that the market is pricing in out there. Of course, post Powell this week, the chances of a rate decrease in the Feb, excuse me, in the March meeting taking a bit of a hit. Right now we're hanging out at about a 61.5% probability that the rates will stay unchanged in March, 38.5% that they'll cut them by a quarter of a point. One of the cool things they've added to the Fed Watch too is you can go back and look and see how those probabilities have changed historically. Just uh, earlier this week, just on the Fed day, I should say, we got up to about a 53% probability that there was going to be a cut in March. Of course, that has now fallen by the wayside and about a 45% probability that we were going to keep things the same. There was even almost a 2% chance that they're going to cut it all the way down to half a point. That obviously has gone the way of the dodo now. We go all the way back about a month to the end of the year last year. They were pricing in a 15% probability of a half a point rate cut. So again, Things were kind of looking optimistic post-Fed uh, at the end of the year last year. 73% chance that we were going to take things down a quarter of a point. So there was very little chance going to keep things the same, only 11.5%. And oh, how that has changed now, up to a 61% chance we're going to keep things the same. So a full 50-point increase since the end of December. So again, just shows you how things change during a Fed week. Uh, Mr. Dan, a lot going on out there. What did you think about what Powell and company had to say this week. And what did you think about FedWatch and the market's reaction to everything, sir? I think it's reasonable. I, I, it's, you know, I know the, the stock market, we want to remember, is always forward thinking. It's thinking about, well, look, inflation's come down a little bit. Let's cut rates. And do they really have a reason to do that? If you're the Fed, if you put that hat on, what do you have going for you? Well, inflation has cooled off a bit. Employment is still resilient. So, but are you at your objective of 2%? And, you know, Mark, I got to tell you, that number concerns me a bit. Uh, if you look at United States, Bank of England, you know, ECB, Japan, uh, Canada, Australia, they're all using 2% for inflation. What makes that a magic number? Do we know that that is the, well, what they refer to as the R star or the U star? You know, you'll hear uh, Powell mention, um, you know, if you look at the stars, what he's referring to is not as astrological, but it, it was something that was created in 1898 by a Scandinavian, actually, or a Swedish uh, economic uh, analyst, and I, I think can't, can't remember his last. I think Wixell was his last name. Anyways, he said our star is an interest rate that maximizes employment and minimizes inflation. That there is a sweet spot. Well, why this two percent? I don't know. And what does concern me is what is the cost to go from three percent down to two percent? Does that push us into a recession? So, in that regard, I think I'm a little concerned about that. But bottom line, has the Fed gotten to this magic two percent? No. So, should they start decreasing rates? Well, they don't want to do it too soon. 
because that can have tremendous impact too. That could throw us into a situation where now we have to increase it again. Ideally for them, once they start cutting back, they don't want to go back to increasing it because it says a lot of things about our economy and inflation and outlook. So they don't want to do that. The other thing, Mark, that I, I think is interesting here when we think about the Fed is not only this magic 2% and the cost of getting to it, but it takes six months to 18 months for our economy to feel it. I mean, you and I and everybody listening, we see the market response instantly. We see the market response to every word that the Fed says. You know, for example, one of the things that the Fed left out in this commentary is they didn't say, well, in the future, we could increase interest rates. They didn't make that comment. So that does say something about their outlook. But it takes a while. So, you, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm happy that the Fed didn't do anything or that's their outlook. I do not think they should do anything in March and maybe not until towards the end of the year. And they kind of hinted towards that. But to me, you want to allow time for our economy to continue to absorb what they've done so far. And I, I just don't think that's done yet. And we've seen the resiliency in labor. We've seen the resiliency in terms of earnings and other things that are happening out there. So this idea of a soft landing, hmm, maybe that's in the realm of possibilities. So from my and, and these, what you're bringing up, by the way, in the Fed Watch at the CME, it, it, you're absolutely correct. It's a terrific tool, and it does show something about the outlook and the anticipation. Because, you know, Mark, what have you and I seen over the last few days? We see a stock market anticipating what the Fed should do. So it's an anticipation move, and the Fed doesn't do what the market wants. Yesterday, oh my gosh, it drops. Well, from my point of view, yesterday, the market absorbed what the Fed didn't do, So it, it, which it considered bearish. Okay, so it drops. Is there a reason now to continue lower? Not really. Do we have any earth-shattering fundamental data coming out today? Not really. We have some earnings reports coming out a bit later, and that's going to be important. And we have employment numbers coming out tomorrow. So I think the market is acting orderly. And I think the Fed is kind of doing what they should do at this point in the whole process. All right, let's keep on rolling. Let's go out to the movers and shakers for this week. Uh, looking at the chart, listeners, you'll see it's pretty much, I'd say, about a 60-40 light side over dark side week, so slightly more green than red, but not exactly as biased as we have seen it in weeks past. That said, Mr. Dan, where should we begin our journey, to the light side or to the dark side, sir? Well, I let's start with the light side. Let's go green, sir. Why not? To the light side we go. Number five, off to the metals. It's palladium up 3.62%. You know the deal with palladium. Probably not going to break it down on the show. Not a ton of options volume there. Number four, off to the rates. It's the ultra 30 year up 4.5% this week. So a banger week across the board in the rates complex. Number three, it's oats. Back to the ags uh, up 5.14%. Oats moving a lot. Doesn't drive the paper commensurate with that movement. So unfortunately, not going to be hanging out there. Uh, number two is Bitcoin. Same deal, up 8.11%. Bitcoin, love to talk about crypto on the show every week. Just not putting up the numbers yet to get there. And the number one, back to the ags, this time to the dairy. It is class three milk, up 8.24%. So uh, aggressive week across the board there. Now to the dark side, there is some ags on both sides of the fence this week. Let's including the number five. We have Casey Wheat off 2.63%. It was number two to the light side last week, up nearly 5%. Again, you're talking sub-10,000 contracts, so probably not going to hang out out there. Number four is lumber, 
So staying in the ags, going to the softs, off nearly 3% this week. You know the deal with lumber volume as well, so probably not going to hang out out there. Number three, off to the energy, off 3.81% is our Bob this week. Again, not a huge option stalwart. Number two, to the sofa we go, off 4.59% for three months so far. Haven't talked so far in a while. Maybe we'll make that onto the show this week. And our number one light side mover, or I should say number one dark side mover this week, listeners. Once again, it's Nat Gas. Nothing can stop. I said it on the show last week, Dan, that Nat Gas is kind of undeniable at this point. <laughs> that seems to be the case again this week. Off 5.69%. It was number one to the dark side last week, off 9.37%. So spoiler alert, we may have to talk about a little bit of Nat Gas this week. Don't blame me, listeners. Blame the fact that Nat Gas is... Freaking undeniable at this point. Look at the volume numbers again. That That is still the case. Before we get there, we're going to add another wrinkle to the movers and shakers. We've been thinking for a while, how can we uh, add some more data for you folks on the movers and shakers front? We like to talk underlying movement clearly. But, you know, there's another side to the moving and shaking front. That is the vol side. And, you know, we had Derek Salmon on not too long ago. He's been kind of the keeper of the sea ball complex for a long time. They've been building it up for quite a while and it's an interesting offering. It's a way to look at the vol spectrum outside of your typical vol analysis, which is, of course, VIX and the equity indices and equity vol. Looking at it across the board, across all the products that they trade over there at CME. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to add a little bit of a C vol volatility, if you will, movers and shakers to the movers and shakers this week and probably going forward as well if you folks like it. I'm going to choose this time, Dan. I'm going to go to the dark side to start with. And then our number five, again, these are vol movers. So net vol movers. I'm not going to talk percent because I know percent over percent drives people crazy. We'll just talk net vol points for now. Uh, number five, we have platinum off about a third of a point. The C vol, again, there are vol indices for each of these products. You can go find them over there. Just search for CME C vol. Uh, that C vol, that vol level hanging out about a 2379 right now off about a third of a point. Number five to the dark side this week. Number four, you will also see if you go to the C vol page. There are aggregate indices that they put out that combine an entire complex into one number. In this case, number four to the dark side is the ag aggregate index uh, coming in at an 1876 off exactly half a point this week. So ag vol in aggregate to that five times fast uh, coming in about half a point this week. Uh, the rest of it is pretty much all ags. Actually, number three, we have soybeans. Uh, 18 and a quarter off about 0.85 this week. Number two, we have Chicago wheat, 28, pretty much even off about a 1.17. And then the largest dark side vol mover this week, lean hogs at a 23.29 off about a little over two, about 2.15 points. So vol coming in across the board on the ag side and a little bit of metals as well. Now to the light side vol movers and shakers we go. Number five, we have again, going to the aggregate indices. It's the treasury aggregate index and hopefully you like a little bit of rates because it's dominating our light side this week uh, the treasury aggregate index at a 126 pretty much even up exactly four points on the week so aggregate treasury vol ticking up this week that may surprise you given what we saw out there now of course if you go to c vol you can look at the treasury vol in two ways you know denominated by price or denominated by yield we're defaulting to the yield methodology which is kind of the more standard nomenclature but you could play around with it by price if you like as well the products will still be the same. The number is obviously going to be different if you're looking at it by price versus yield. But two ways to carve up that onion on the rate side. Number four to the light side vol movers this week, we have the two-year at about 152.95. Again, that's the vol level, listeners, the C vol level. Up almost six points, 5.84 points. Number three, right behind it, we have the five-year at a 136.70. Up nearly six points exactly on the week Number two, we're going out to the one year. So far, we have 153 and about a, actually 153 pretty much even up about 7.6 points on the week. And the number one light side vol mover this week, three months so far at 116.88, up about 16 and a quarter points on the week. So vol looking frothy out there in the rates complex. So a lot to unpack on the show this week, Dan. I think we have two clear contenders for our starting point this week. We can go to the undeniable beast that is Nat Gas or to the rates complex. Where do you want to start this week, Dan? Gosh, you know, you adding in here the the C vow makes it really an interesting perspective. And uh, because if you look at that, uh, the the positive side on that, uh, they're all rate related. And uh, 
No, I'll tell you what. Let's look at nat gas. I had a Mention feeling. It. I had a feeling you're going to go. That's why I, I already have it up on my screen, sir. It's like we've done this show before <laughs> once or twice. All right. To the realm of energy we go, listeners. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody. You know where to go. to Check out these reports for yourself. SeeMeGroup.com slash Twifo is the place to go. Once you're there, pop into that energy drop down in the asset class. That'll be down three slots. Then go down three more slots in the product family to Nat Gas, and then you're off to the races. You could join us for this just explosive, pun intended, party. That is Nat Gas right now. Nat Gas threatening a two-handle as we're kicking off the show here. A 2.05, pretty much. <laughs> off nearly 13 cents or about almost 6% just since Monday. Obviously, if we go back <coughs> excuse me, to the end of our show last week, it's off uh, about, about, actually about the exact same level, about 5.7% there as well. Uh, so intriguing stuff there. Nat Gas... It's been interesting to watch out here of late, kind of been in a bit of a death spiral of late out there, and the volume reflecting this, the volume just off the charts. That's why we said on the show last week, this is becoming just an undeniable product to talk about every week. It used to be 400, 450 was a decent week out there for NatGas. We've been hitting a million with regularity lately. This week... 820,000, so still nearly 2x what we normally talk about out here. Uh, Dan, have you noticed this as well with Nat Gas? Almost an order of magnitude change in the volume out there where we used to talk about 400, 450, maybe half a million if things were really lighting it up in Nat Gas. Now we're talking 750, 800, a million contracts a week. You're starting to sniff, uh, you know, E-mini and Sofer territory in Nat Gas. Have you noticed this as well, Dan? And what do you attribute this to? Yeah, I I totally agree with you, Mark. And I I don't know the answer first, but my observation is it's where it's positioned globally. You know, when we look at this market, we think about us in the United States. And to get a feel for that, uh, nothing too much has changed. About a third of our natural gas consumption goes to heat our home, cook our food. Another third goes to the chemical and steel industry, so it's industrial applications. And the last third goes to electricity generation. And then we have, where does that fit in to the global picture? And what we have now that we didn't have just a few years ago, really, is we now have the ability to export Nat gas and and those export facilities are full. They're running at max levels. There's another facility they're talking about building in Louisiana, currently uh, that's been shut down uh, in Washington. We'll see if that comes back up again. About seventy percent of our nat gas is going to Europe, and the rest is going to Asia. So we are seeing that global demand. We are getting the ability to export it. Uh, We're now the world's largest exporter of nat gas. Uh, And if you look at Europe, we have now more import facilities. You know, in the past, Germany had no import facility for nat gas because basically they got most of their nat gas from Russia. So what we've seen is the global energy supply shifting. And where people look for energy, how they get it, that's all changed just over the last couple of years. And the primary change has been the Russia invasion of Ukraine. And a lot of people say, wow, Russia's really got to be hurt uh, with all these sanctions. Well, when it comes to energy, one of its main sources of income, it really hasn't been hurt much. Uh, You know, China... India, uh, some other Asian countries have soaked up a lot of that supply. And if you're India and Russia comes to you and says, you know something, I'll sell you energy, $30 off the price when it comes to crude and when it comes to nat gas. So you're going to take it. Also, we're seeing transactions occurring outside of U.S. dollars. That plays a role here in nat gas and crude oil 
it's priced globally in U.S. dollars. And, you know, these countries just, they don't want to use U.S. dollars anymore. We have $300 billion of Russia assets, not assets, they're dollars that come through our system. So if you trade in dollars, the United States has the ability to touch that. So what we're seeing is a lot of countries are now building their gold supply in their central banks because they can take gold, use that for transactions, take gold and transition it into other currencies. So they have the ability to do that. So I think even for those countries, the appreciation of hedging, of the ability to monitor or offset potential risk using the futures contracts, it's at all time high levels. Like you pointed out, Mark, we're seeing an explosion in volume. And what fascinates me is, okay, if we have an increase in volume, then when you look at a market from my point of view, I think about it in terms of the absorption rate. How much can a market absorb before you really start seeing volatility, before the spreads between the bid and offers really widen? Well, and I think from a trading point of view, that tells you when you find that absorption rate, the maximum level you're going to get on your trading strategy. Well, what we've seen here, as you pointed out, volume's increasing. But Mark, look at the ranges that we're seeing. They're, they're not explosive. In some ways, I think they're orderly. Nat gas on a daily chart, it's fairly orderly. We had, you know, three days ago, a big drop. And then as we rolled to the next contract, then we had two days inside the range. Today, it's trading right back down. What you want to see, if you're looking at the NASCAT gas chart, is we are getting near the magic $2. And that becomes a significant level for this market. So it's that old saying on the floor, you know, Mark, first time downs a fade, second time's a go with. So the expectation would be if we kiss $2, it would be a kiss. We can go down, maybe even trade through it, but we close back above it. The next time we go down, the idea it's a go with, you expect it to trade through it. So how it behaves if it does do that scenario gives us an idea about a longer term outlook for uh, nat gas. So it's at a critical level approaching that right now from a technical and fundamental point of view. I don't see a reason for it not to go lower fundamentally. You know, we have a lot of nat gas. We also have weather conditions that are constantly changing the United States from very, very cold to right now, my backyard, I don't have any snow. Very unusual for this time of year. We're in the 40s and we should be in the 20s or 30s. So the demand has changed. Supply is there. But I think that global positioning, it's gone through a transition and it continues. So that's my guess on why we're seeing this change in this market. I'm so glad you brought that up, Mark. Yeah, it's it's almost uh, a different product, I would say, now than it was even, let's say, a year ago when we were talking about Because we were talking about ex explosive volatility levels out there. The volume levels outside of a few aberrant months never really reached this on a consistent basis. And yet now here we are threatening a million uh, pretty much every week out here, which is crazy. Uh, speaking of crazy, let's look at some of this volume out here. I want to get your thought on some of these uh, some of these trades we have going up here but first let's set the table here listeners like we said almost 900,000 contracts on the table about 830 or so uh on the tape right now out here in NACAS. so a, a very strong volume week and we're back to that front month dominating the tape there is no nearer dated contract right now so the closest you can get to the fire is the march contract has about 25 days to go and that's where about almost 40 percent of you are playing this week everybody wanting to get that high gamma option out there what is the vol in that front march contract at about a 61 off about a quarter 
So not a huge change on the Nat Gas front month vol front. Kind of treading water this week. Similar deal for the skew. Last week, the puts were kind of flat. They're slightly discounted this week, down about a point. Again, when you're talking about a 61 at the money vol, one point kind of meaningless. It might as well be flat. Uh, the calls were slightly bid last week, 3.1% bid. That remains the case this week, 3.2% bid. So the skew kind of remaining unchanged this week, even as Nat Gas has continued to drop off. Now, what's kind of interesting is we're not seeing, like Dan was talking about the two strike. I was expecting a lot of two strike paper to lead the dance this week as we're threatening the two handle boatload of two puts coming in leading the dance maybe bidding up that put skew a little bit if people thought we were going to break through it or maybe vice versa if people thought we were going to bounce off it selling it hard crushing that put skew we're not really seeing that we're seeing again this kind of front month skew kind of hanging out almost at equilibrium right now saying well, we don't know when the next shoe is going to drop or which direction is going to take us so we're kind of fine just vacillating around this two handle for a little bit and the paper flow, Dan, kind of surprising me this week as well. Because, again, you were talking about the two-handle. When I fired this up, I thought for sure, okay, 60,000 of this at least is going to be the two puts, right? Because that's we're threatening that strike. Everyone's worried about it or maybe thinks we're going to bounce off it. Either way, two puts all the time in March. But that is not the case, sir. The number one most active contract in NatGas this week on another explosive, pun intended, week, Dan. Uh, the two half calls in March going up 45,000 times. Uh, wow. The big day today, 17,300 today, almost 16,000 yesterday. So opening opening every day this week, 6,800 on Monday, also opening 5,300 on Tuesday. Now, obviously, there's going to be two-sided flow there. It's not all buying, but if past his prologue, a lot of people are probably buying the March two-half calls. Uh, the OI coming into today is about 24,000, Dan. So a lot of paper going up this week. It's, how does that resonate for you a two half call expiring in about 25 days uh would you be a buyer of those dan i <laughs> know uh, i yeah. don't think so Mark. i don't think and, so either yeah you know it, it's what's interesting and that's why i love what you do and how important it is what you do because it does give you an idea of how a market's shaping up it does tell us something about attitude and about beliefs you know if you if you looked at the forecast that we've had just on the weather front uh you would think we'd be above that 250 uh, with you know the, the weather changes the production of electricity you would think that demand curve would drive it but we're just not seeing it so we're seeing people anticipating something that's just not becoming reality and so the idea of what when i look at options i want to get paid for the trade my patience level actually is fairly short because if i'm putting a trade on because of a certain price action, which is usually what I'm looking at along with the fundamentals, then I expect a movement within actually two to five days. And if I don't get it, my expectations not being met, I'll take that trade off and give it the big adios and put that premium back in my pocket and look for another opportunity. Here, wow, people are holding on to that Dream. You know, Mark, something that bothers me is when somebody says, well, you know, that option only cost me $500. I'll just, I don't know, I'll just wait and see. Who knows? Maybe it'll take off 50 cents. Well, to me, what they're saying is they're having a, they have a non-performing trade and they're in the hope trade. They're hoping that it goes up there and God forbid they get into the prayer phase because that's not good. Uh, and I feel like that's some of what we're seeing here right now uh, with that anticipation. Very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, while you were talking, I was just pulling up some of the block trading tools to see if I could find what the hell is going on on this strike. Are people buying them? Are people selling them? Looks like most of the blocks I can find, Dan, are rolls from either the three strike or the two and three quarter strike down to the two half strike for 400, 500, 1,000 here or there. Either way, they're still buying the two halves, Dan. So wow. <laughs> there's there's wow. buy. I mean, they're they're rolling from even less realistic strikes, but still looks like a lot of these going up for around nine cents. That's the price. 
So uh, two half calls, 25 days for around nine cents, listeners. Would you be a buyer at that level? Uh, I mean, it's not the most expensive lottery ticket, but it still is definitely a lottery ticket out here. 200 lots. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by this, Dan. <laughs> this is really me, crazy. Me too. And you, you know, if you saw verticals or something else that could justify some of that, then that would kind of, well, I don't know if it makes sense, but at least it kind of gives you a logic. Uh, here, I, it's just so far out of the ballpark. Um, yeah, it's not an area I live in, so I, I don't <laughs> understand it. But if you jump to number two, we see paper that might make a little bit more sense. It's the two puts in March. That's kind of what I thought would be leading the dance by a huge margin, Dan, but that is clearly not the mm. case. Uh, 36,000 of these going up this week. The big day, kind of a tie between today and Monday, both about 10,300, 10,400 each. Opening on Monday, about 9,500 on Tuesday, also opening. Uh, taking some off on Wednesday, so I guess as we got a little bit closer to the two handles, some folks were already taking their puts off. And then about 11,000 almost today, 10,500. Guess against OI of 43,000. So if I had to guess, probably opening again today. So that paper makes mm. more sense to me. That's what I was looking for coming in here, but not, not the two halves. But again, that's why we do the show. That's why we crunch the numbers. So we can yeah. see the weirdo paper that is going on out here. And then the two puts not doing it for you, Dan. How about the one and three quarters? Haven't talked about a one-handle put in forever. In oh, that my gas. gosh, and yeah. Here we are again, one and three quarters, 28,000 of these. Again, the big day today, 10,000 of those going up today against an open interest of about 16,000. So anyone's guess what they're doing. Maybe they're rolling some of those two puts down to the one and three quarters already. Seems kind of early, but we've seen crazier yeah. things. Uh, they were opening on the one and three quarter puts earlier in the week, including 8,000 on Tuesday, closing yesterday. And again, anyone's guess what they were doing today. And then we, if you had two halves weren't doing it for you, Dan, the two and three quarters were trading 26,000 times this week. I already pointed out some of that is rolling paper. Looks like including yesterday, we saw about 7,900 go up yesterday versus 15,000 of the two halves. So we have seen people rolling one by two, selling one of the the uh, two and three quarter calls, buying two of the two half calls. So I don't know uh, if that makes it better for you or not. But so that's what we're seeing out there. So that's probably why the two and three quarter calls are lighting it up out here. If we go a little bit farther out, listeners, let's say if we go out to, oh, I don't know, May, how about the one half puts lighting it up out there, Dan, 28,000, actually about 26,000 times this week. So again, it's, uh, they are not pricing in, at least from an options perspective. Uh, they're not trading a lot of strikes that show me outside of the two halves, Dan, <laughs> not showing me a lot of optimism <laughs> here. Those are in another league by themselves. Uh, one half puts 26,000 times this week out in May. Uh, the big day for those, Tuesday, 13,000 of those. The paper taking some off on Tuesday. Again, you're already taking off your, your May one-half puts. I guess we've seen crazier things. Uh, so interesting stuff across the board. Uh, Dan, we could probably do the rest of the show in energy, but it was a Fed week. What do you say we get to some rates next? Sure. That sounds good. The Fed. The yield curve. Inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. All right, listeners, to the world of rates we go. You know how to find this fun. Go into that asset class drop down. Scroll down from energy. You're going to go down another three slots to interest rates. Then you go into U.S. rates in the product family. And then where we go from there, it could be anyone's. The three months so far is obviously lighting it up on the vol front and also on the dark side movers and shakers this week. But of course, it's not a product that a lot of you can really trade that easily. So I hesitate to talk about three months so far, even though almost 9 million contracts going up this week, 8.7 million contracts. Again, that puts into perspective. We're talking about how active Nat Gas is. Three months so far on another level, listeners, when it comes to volume. We could certainly go out there. I don't know how informative that is for the lion's share of you out there. But I'll take a look at some other products. But Dan, obviously, all eyes were on rates this week. What products and what complexes were catching your eye out there this week, sir? And what, what was lighting up your tape? Well, I think, you know, the 10-year and the 30-year, uh, 10-year notes, 30-year bonds, uh, I thought their behavior was, I guess, orderly is the word I'm thinking of. You know, as we see those yields coming off, you know, we saw it yesterday or actually last few days, about last four days in bonds. Uh, the yields got softer and we see those bond prices because I'm looking at the futures on price. 
uh, prices were getting stronger. And that's what we saw here today. We're seeing that follow through. And, you know, typically, or yeah, in the past, if you think about it, when the stock market would have a down day, that means people are selling the stock market, right? And that money goes someplace. And it would you would see it in commodities, you'd see it in eggs, you would see it in metals, which we're not seeing right now. And you would also see it in bonds and notes and the interest rate yield curve because people take their money at risk in the stock market, risk on to risk off. And risk off means you see that capital shift towards these other markets interest rates being one of them. But here we have an up day or a, a reasonable day in the stock market, but we're also seeing yet yield come off and prices increasing in the bond futures markets. We've seen this relationship like this now for a while, which isn't typical, but that's what we're seeing. There's nothing telling us that uh, the prices that we're looking at on the interest rate side should be backing off. I, I think a sideways move here would make sense. And but we still have a market positioning itself for tomorrow. Right. And we have potential excuses coming out tomorrow that could change the attitude towards interest rates. And it'll be reflected uh, in these two contracts. Uh, I, I look at those because I find them interesting. The short end of the curve is also very important. And the relationship between the two and 10 yields, a lot of people look at that spread. And, you know, the expectation was when that first happened, uh, I guess it was over a year ago now, they said, okay, we're in a recession. We're going to be in a recession because the two and 10 crossed. Well, if you look at the history of that, when that would happen, it would be over a year after that. And usually the stock market actually did pretty well during that period. And right now, I don't think we have the fundamentals that imply recession. So that relationship, the 210 spread, um, it almost feels discounted a little bit. Uh, by the marketplace in terms of the expectation of what should happen. I know a lot of people feel the recession's coming, and it may be, may be, but we just don't see um, the signs of something like that right now. I guess the, the thought would be, Mark, can this continue? Can we see these yields continue going down? I mean, it was just, you know, early or latter part of last year, it was in December. Uh, the price on the 30 year bond was at 126. We're around 124 right now. So, two handles more, we, we can easily do that. And we've been higher in the past as well. So, I, I just find it fascinating this complex in terms of fundamentals, and then also the price action that we're seeing. Let's get out some of that action out here this week. Listen, we did a little quick flash poll while, you, while Dan was talking, because there are so many different choices in the treasury complex. In terms of which ones are really relevant to you, obviously we said three months so far is lighting it up from a volume perspective. It's on our movers and shakers and our vol movers and shakers. Uh, we also have the two-year and the five-year and the vol movers and shakers. We know for a lot of you, though, it really lives and dies around the 10-year. That's where you like to play. That's what you typically have in your portfolios. I mean, we just did our flash poll right now. 100% of the vote coming back in the early voting. You folks want us to talk about the 10-year on the show this week. So I think we're going to head out there. Obviously, a banger week on the 10-year as well, even if it's not lighting up our movers and shakers this week. Uh, nearly 4 million contracts, 3.87 million contracts on the tape. So again... The treasury complex <laughs> tends to put everything else into context when we're talking about volume numbers. An explosive week for Nat Gas, nearly a million contracts, nearly four million in the 10 years. So again, just uh, on another level when it comes to volume. Where is that future hanging out in the 10 year right now? 
to be precise out there, listeners, up nearly 2%, about 1.7% out here in that front future. Again, that's only one day to go. Uh, interestingly enough, we always talk about the zero day stuff. And if we were talking about the E-mini, that one day to go contract would probably be leading the volume dance right now. But nope, of this nearly 4 million contracts, 47% going up in the March contract has about 22 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there, listeners, which is, dare I say it, refreshing. <laughs> Talking about something that is not popping off tomorrow. Obviously, we did that in NatGas as well. It is nice to get away from what's happening instantaneously in the world of options sometimes. Are we going to do that right now? In terms of vol, treasury complex, never been a bastion of volatility. Now, of course, if you heard me break down the C vol at the top of the show, you know in aggregate the whole treasury complex getting a little bit more juice this week, which is kind of interesting. Usually when you have the event risk come off the table, you see the vol implode. Not the case this week. In fact, uh, the March vol hanging out almost a, a whopping 7, <laughs> a 691 up nearly nine tenths of a point. So again, that kind of gets back to what our sea balls were telling us. Vol, at least comparatively, very explosive right now. That's a huge move, nearly a full point. You're starting at about a six, a one point move or just about. That's huge. Uh, so yeah, the treasury complex threatening a seven in the 10 year right now in the March from a vol perspective. So just bonkers volatility. I don't know what we're going to do with ourselves, all this vol listeners. In terms of skew last week, the puts 5% cheap this week. Flat, not surprising there after the event. We've seen a little bit of evolution out there. The calls last week, 6.7% bid. So you had a nice little uh, bullish risk reversal setup where you can come out there if you wanted to and actually, or I should say, collar setup. And you could really buy some cheap puts, sell some at least somewhat pricier calls. You're not getting a ton, but you're getting something. Uh, this week, most of that juice is gone. 2.7% bid are the calls this week. So fascinating stuff. Then comes the tsunami of paper, listeners. The 111 half puts leading the dance. And again, when we talk about the numbers out here, again, it puts everything else into context. The 111 half puts doing 168,000 contracts this week. So that in and of itself is going to be more than most of your ag products, most of your metals outside of gold. I mean, it's more than small caps. Just that one put. Again, it just shows you how much paper going up out here this week. 168199 to be precise. Uh, the big day, almost all of that today. That's the other fascinating thing. And Dan, I'm curious if you notice this as well. What always fascinates me about the treasury complex is that they are very binary products. They can turn it on and they can turn it off on a dime. Today we are doing 132000 of the 111 half puts in March, yesterday 10,000, the day before 12,000, and about 12,000 on Monday. So uh, you're talking over a 10x increase today. And we see that in other products as well here in the treasury complex. This ability to just turn volume on and off on a dime, Dan, it just, it's always fascinated me out there. I totally agree. And I think maybe the driver behind that is it's institutional paper and some of the institutions my path crosses you know a small trade it could be 10,000 contracts that could be an average trade so on some trading desk to participate here in this market arena when it comes to interest rates especially the 10 year size is not uncommon uh, by nature of the product itself and how it's used institutionally. and uh, But you're absolutely right. It can turn on a dime and the volume is there. And the tenure, uh, I think, is the shining light for a lot of people when they think about interest rates. It used to be the 30-year bonds, but that shifted a number of years ago. There's still volume there, but the 10-year, I think, kind of leads the way. 10-year leads the dance, I know, for a lot of our listeners. And if you're saying to yourself, well, maybe that's just an aberration on the 111 halves, all that volume going up today. Let's go to the 111 quarters. Right behind it, going up 135,000 times this week. And unlike the 111 halves, which did all that volume today, they did all their volume on Tuesday, 113,000 on Tuesday so it's not like we've been seeing size rolls one day or the other, anything like that. It's just been opening every day and every strike. <laughs> Obviously opening on, on Monday. I don't have the OI for that day, but 55,000 is the OI right now. So just, again, 
size paper and very staccato paper. In fact, if I had to guess, I would say it looks like it might have been a 111 quarter, 110 quarter. But he can't even say it's a roll because it was opening on both of those puts on Tuesday as well. 120,000 of the 110 quarter puts traded against 113,000 of the 111 quarter puts all on Tuesday. You know, all this flow going up the day before the meeting kind of makes some sense. I mean, the first day of the meeting, the 111 half puts printing today, kind of weird. But again, that's what we're crunching the numbers for here so we can see it all for ourselves. So 111 half, 111 quarter, 110 quarter puts leading the dance all well north of 100,000 contracts. Uh, also, not to be outdone, though, we did see some uh, near dated puts going up this week as well, including 110 and three quarter puts expiring tomorrow listeners so there is some near dated just a lot of longer term stuff as well a 110 and three quarter puts going up 141,000 times this week and this again we're all over the place in terms of what day is driving the liquidity this time it was monday 110,000 of these going up all opening on monday uh the rest of the week they were taking them off so putting on a whole bunch of 110 and three quarter puts, and then dialing out of them the rest of the week. Only 1,800 today. There's still 72,000 open on this strike, so they got a day left. If they want to get out of these, they got to get the heck out of Dodge uh, in about a day. So intriguing stuff here. But again, the focuses of liquidity, the pockets of volume, it's all over the place in this product, which again, makes it fascinating. It's not all just Wednesday. Or a little bit, uh, you know, in the morning afterwards. It, or maybe leading into it on Tuesday. It's all over the place. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and today. Which, again, is kind of fascinating. Which is why we crunch these numbers here. Uh, speaking of crunching the numbers here, listen, as you folks right now, two-thirds of you are still saying uh, the 10 years is what you want. A third of you saying three months so far. I guess we can go really quickly if we like. Just because the folks asked, Dan, and because it is on our movers and shakers this week, to the three months so far. Again, this is a massive institutional beast, not for the faint of heart. 8.75 million contracts on the tape. Dan, because the people asked, let's take them home a little bit of three months so far. What's catching your eye out there this week, sir? Well, I think let's finish the 10 year notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. See, it chokes me up just thinking about <laughs> You're this. emotional, all this great stuff. <laughs> well, I, I think on the 10-year, we want to remember last May, we were at 117, and we're at 112 right now, or 112, three quarters, or 112, 28. Uh, so we have some room to the upside. It's not like we're bumping our head against the ceiling. Uh, so there is room to rally in this market. Those puts that you were talking about, I do find interesting. And you know, those are a bit more logical compared to what we were talking about in that gas. And the, the next levels that really become important, if you look at past price behavior, when it comes to the, the 10 year notes, <clears throat> excuse me, they're even numbers. And that's not unusual for the interest rate market. Uh, so 114 would be the next level. We could really start finding some sellers that we've seen in the past. The other one is 115. So another full handle up. And then 117, I think, would be the biggie. We spent a lot of time, though, around 116. So it's almost like every big handle as we move up, you would see the potential for this market to go sideways, not necessarily fall out of bed. And that's what's fascinating. I would expect that to do that. I would expect yields to increase, and instead we're seeing them decreasing, which also says something about the outlook that people have going forward. You know, just like the stock market, the interest rate market gives us a reference about the outlook. And and I think that's what we're seeing here, not only in the 10-year, but in that three years, I mean, three-month as well. You know, and, and that's really kind of a consistency of behavior is what I call it. Uh, so I don't see anything unusual right now in the interest rate markets in terms of behavior, uh, which fascinates me. They are such a deep, liquid market, and they have – uh, 
they have so much potential in terms of liquidity. So it's not a market you have to worry about getting in and not being able to get out. That's for sure. So it's it's really uh, interesting to me when it comes to the sorry the three month uh, that ninety five level is going to be important for us if indeed this market does start to move. Uh, we we've spent a lot of time there before earlier part of this year actually, and but we've been a bit higher there as well too. But the ninety five is the first level I would look for it to possibly bump its head. So first time up, I would look for a sideways move in that market. On the downside, if indeed it gets below 94.80, you want to see it trading around 94.70 within about three days, three to five days after it breaks that level, uh, because that would imply continuation. Uh, if it doesn't uh, move with that kind of momentum, then look for a sideways move. Not that it would necessarily drop out of bed, but a sideways move there would be more likely. So around that 94.80, 94.70, if it does break lower, and today it is softer, you know, it's we're seeing the opposite of what we saw in the 10-year notes and the 30-year bonds here. So we are seeing some selling. And no, can it get weaker? All right, Mr. Dan, that music means we're coming up against it here. Man, time flies when we're having fun here on Twipo. Did you have a good time, sir, for your second appearance on the show this year? Always, Mark, always. It's, I find it, I love going through these markets, and, uh, and you add that extra dimension that people just don't see, and it's that hidden agenda in some ways behind the outlook of a market that you share with us. And I think that's so important. I certainly didn't have the two half calls in that gas on my bingo card for today. So I get surprised <laughs> on this show every week as well. That's why I have to tune into my own show every week, listeners, just to see what the heck's going up out here. It's always surprising and fascinating to me. Speaking of surprising and fascinating, Dan, your content, your videos, always surprising and or fascinating. If folks want to check them out for themselves, where should they go? What should they do? Well, they can take a a look at a free video. I do it every day at dangramsa.com. And if you haven't looked at futures, it could be a place to start is just to watch them, see how they behave. And so I provide commentary on 22 different markets, six different sectors. You'll see red and green lines, which mean buy and sell levels. Uh, these are not buy and sell recommendations. Uh, but just ideas that I'd like to share with you. You can go back 10 years on these videos that are recorded to say, okay, what did Dan say when this happened? And where were those red and green lines? Those numbers, those lines will change uh, as the markets uh, evolve. So it's a place to maybe get some references, of course, there and also in a more advanced video. But I, I take a peek at those, uh, the free video. If you're interested in taking a look at that, and hopefully you'll have some ideas to think about. There you go. Check him out. Dan Gramza, G-R-A-M-Z-A dot com is the place to go. Of course, you know where to go. Check out all the data we got cooking over here on the show. Seemegroup.com slash Twifo. While you're there, you can, of course, always check out the CVOL, C-V-O-L indices, as well as, of course, the Fed Watch. A lot of great tools to keep you engaged over there at Seemegroup.com. That's going to do it for us on the network today back again tomorrow noon central 1 p.m eastern for a little bit of the old volatility views who's going to join us i guess you got to tune in every week to find out who's going to help crunch the vol numbers for this crazy fed week and then after that exclusively for you cool cats and kittens over there in the secret club check it out for yourselves the options insider.com slash pro is the place to go there's still time to get in there before tomorrow's show to join us for options oddities of course get all the other cool stuff get your name entered in the hat for the february pro trading crate and of course 300 plus exclusive shows coming at you the second you hit that button so we will keep you engaged informed dare i say it maybe it'll even a little bit entertained the options insider.com slash pro no guarantees on that last one though as we kick off next week on monday with the option block all the way through to next thursday another episode of This Week in Futures Options.
stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rule book of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 